things. And to do that, I want to invite Mark Rusinovich out on stage. Mark, you know, is a technical fellow for us. He's been a great partner and champion through the entire Windows 7 development process. Please join me in welcoming Mark Rusinovich. Mark, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. This is uh, very exciting for me because I've spoken at TechEd since 2001. It's my favorite conference. And I've been at Microsoft for three years now, which means I've been super excited a lot of times since in those last three years. But this is really special, so I've come up with a new term I want to share with you. I'm really passionate about virtualization, as you know, so I'm going to try this one out on you and let me know what you think. Hopefully we can spread it. I'm hyper excited to be here this morning. OK, not so good? Super excited then? All right. So I want to, uh, what Bill just showed you was BitLocker and the fact that BitLocker required him to actually encrypt the key, group policy re required him to encrypt that key before he could copy data onto it. And just like all the features that we design into Windows, we want to make sure that it's config they're configurable and controllable by you to provide the behavior that you exactly require. Here with the team machine and show you some of those BitLocker group policy settings. We'll show you how configurable it is. For example, we can require that uh, smart cards are being used to protect the data on the key. We can also configure a password complexity policy so that Bill just can't enter his dog's name as his password and allow somebody to quickly gain access to it. The one that Bill ran into, though, is this one here, deny right access to removal drives not protected by BitLocker, which you can see we've enabled. So we can make sure that those drives are encrypted and not require end users like Bill to have to before they come to data, things to work to corporate policy. It's our job, or your job, to make sure that he does. One of the biggest sources of, of costs in most of your organizations, I know, is end user lost productivity because they've got configuration problems, they've got malware on their systems, and that's caused by the fact that end users typically, in most organizations, are allowed to run whatever software they want to. So one of the most dramatic ways that you can reduce those costs is by controlling exactly which apps they run so that they're only running the things that they need to do to get their work done. You know that I'm pretty passionate about this too. One of the products that I developed at the company before I joined Microsoft was Protection Manager, which was aimed exactly at this. And one of the, uh, there's been a technology in Windows since Windows 2000 that also is aimed at this, software restriction policies. I bet very few of you actually use software restriction policies though because it's so fragile. The way that identify software is by the hash of the executable image, which means that even if you have the same application but update it to a new version, that that SRP rule you've created breaks, and that means that you've got to go create another rule. In the meantime, the user's not able to run the app. So we've got a basically SRP on steroids inside of Windows 7. It's called AppLocker, and I'm going to show you AppLocker in action because that end user machine that Bill was using is actually locked down with AppLocker with the default policy that says that only the applications that uh, are part of the are allowed to run. So if, if I launch this kind of business app here, the stock viewer, you can see that AppLocker is preventing me from running it. So I'm going to show you how AppLocker's wizard makes it really easy for me to create a rule that makes it so that anytime that stock viewer application updates, I don't have to go revisit that rule, and the user can just continue to use the new versions. Let me go back here. App Locker group policy settings, where I can run the rule wizard. And this is the magic right here. SRP had these and file hash, but App Locker includes this one, the publisher, which leverages the signer, the digital signer of the executable, to create more flexible rules. If I press next, it's going to ask me to point it at a copy of that application. Browse to the one I've got on my network share. And it, it's extracted some information from it, the signer of the application. In this case, you can see that it's sysinternals. Now, you'll see this program has a bug on it, which indicates the fact that I didn't write this application. Then you can see it's got uh, extracted a product name from it, uh, the file name, and the file version. And this slider over here on the, the left lets you dial up or down the specificity of your rule. For example, if I trusted everything from sysinternals, which you should, obviously, then you'd want to set this slider right to here. But if I slide it all the way down to here, I'm creating a rule that says only stock viewer from sysinternals. 
1.0 or higher. So I've really controlled exactly which application from this publisher is allowed to run in, but I still made it flexible because if version 2 comes out, I don't have to go revisit this rule. It's just going to magically work. So let's go create that rule and then go back to that machine, force a group policy update so that that rule comes down, and then I'll be able to run the app. Here in a second. Uh, hopefully that worked. It didn't work. Group policy. Let me go to the backup machine here and see if it works over there. And it'll come down here in a second. And if this one works, oh, it's because I didn't set the rule on the, what's that? I uh, know I hit, I hit cancel where? I hit, in the rule, I hit create. Hold on, let me, try. there it is. Let me try that end user machine group policy update. Sorry about this. Looks like we've got a connectivity problem. There we go. <laughs> it looked like magic, didn't it? So I run the application, and there I'm up and running with that new rule, able to run it. So this is actually a line of business application that Windows 7. In fact, when I try to exercise this trends feature on it, I'm going to get an error. And this highlights kind of a, another cost that you've got in your organization, which is end users running into problems on a day-to-day -day basis and then having to reach out to the help desk to you guys to go fix it for them. And you know that's one of the most painful parts of your job is trying to fi figure out what exactly went wrong when the end user runs into something like this. In this case, they'd probably just call you up and say, hey, the app doesn't work, and that's really helpful. So then you dig in a little bit further, and then they're going to just read some hexadecimal numbers off that dialog box, which also is not very helpful. So what we've done to minimize the length of those calls and get the end user's interpretation out of the way is build a tool into Windows 7 called the Problem Steps Recorder. I'm going to launch the Problem Steps Recorder, which is what you'd do when an end user calls up with a problem like that. And you'd have them run it and press the Start Record button and then reproduce the problem. Click on that Trends button, get the problem and dismiss it, and then stop the recording. And that's going to prompt them to save a zip file that desk. You'd have it up. There's a compiled HTML file inside that has the problem. And I know that in our everyday lives we're going to make use of this. I know personally my mom calls me up every now and then with a computer problem and I want to help her but I just don't understand what the hell she's saying. Now I can see. So this, like I said, this application has an application compatibility problem. And a lot of you are probably rolling out Windows 7, doing app compat work, you're running the application compatibility toolkit and creating shims, and you're wondering, do I have to go through that process again when I go to Windows 7? And the answer is we've made every effort to make sure that all those shims you created for those apps work on Windows 7 as well. When I see this come in from the end user, I recognize this line of business app that I've already created a Vista shim for. And so let's go see me apply that Vista shim and have this application work. And in the process, I'm going to demonstrate another really cool feature that's built into Windows 7, and that's PowerShell v2. Because PowerShell v2 has the ability to target machines remotely. So let's open PowerShell editor. It also has this nice editor debugger, which is new. I'm going to open up that fixed stock viewer script that I've made. And you can see here, that I've targeted that remote computer in the command shim database install program and I'm telling it to install that so let's press go it's going to reach out to that machine install the shim let me go back to the user machine and then relaunch the app press the trends button and the PowerShell push that out. And with the combination of the Problem Steps Recorder and PowerShell, I was able to uh, 